but i think uh, it's it's one of uh, one of its kind of uh, experience because anyone who is alive today would have never imagined something like this to happen absolutely absolutely unprecedented in the past 10 yeah. 100 years yes <laughs> yeah so it's going to be very interesting also from the socio economic point of view it's also kind of a very frightening at that time that moment but we'll see uh yes and at the same time uh, i think it also kind of teaches us that just be ready for anything yeah. and be humble yes <laughs> and, and modest yeah next time i hope that the world will be more prepared for such a pandemic Yes, if, that is possible. If it occurs, hopefully not. So, so I think uh, everywhere it is spreading a message that you have to be humble to people. Yes, uh, yes more exactly. very importantly, we have to be very, very humble towards nature. Yeah, to, to nature, to, towards our colleagues, friends, and... to our selves as well yes to to everything actually to yeah. every and uh, i'm sure that us. also from the from the medical point of view i think the health care systems will probably be we change for this telemedicine webinar zooming all the time yes it yes. will change the face of uh, the way that we deal with yeah health patients as a whole help deliver at the whole conference as a whole yes yes maybe we'll have a hybrid conferences from now on yes uh, a lot of uh, international conferences also are thinking of going digital this time because i think this is going to continue until next year i mean at least international travel will still be restricted absolutely the ean the european academy of neurology which will was supposed to be held in Paris at the end of end of May we go fully virtual the same time the same program parallel session etc and meetings and everything will be fully same time but virtual. It only that it will be digitally delivered yep we did and all the speakers including me Okay. I'll ask ask to prepare the talk in advance to submit the talks i mean to record the talks and synchronize with the slide yes, submit yes, it to the, to the main like, server ah, and, okay uh, then they play it one it, by one yeah play it one by one i'm chairing a full session ending also a speaker in the same session so i'll have to coordinate the, the whole play the whole uh, session and hello natan hi how are you sure but shine i'm good i'm good you said good to hear you i don't how see is, you yet how are how are you how are you dealing how are you dealing with the covid i'm de- myself i'm dealing very well uh the country as i've just discussed uh is uh is well controlled Yeah. and the lockdown was uh, relieved a bit from yesterday and further further uh, steps were taken today so we are going in the right direction but uh, you know this we'll see whether this uh, uh easing on the on the restrictions will be continue in the next two weeks if it's going okay. to stay flat if it's going to stay flat will further it so schools are still closed main shopping malls are still closed cinemas restaurants etc but uh, many of the small shops around mm-hmm. the streets are uh, open even the hairdressers and cosmetics and things like that they decided to open it. Yeah, very good. I think I think we are doing almost similar lines. We are on the similar lines. But um, yeah. I think the the whole world I think that 
currently in most of the places the situation is well out of control. In Europe, okay. many people, many, many countries, uh, Austria, Germany, France are doing well and started to go back to the new routine, the Corona, yeah. the yeah. COVID-19 routine. Yeah. Keeping, keeping distances and things like that. So yeah, we'll have to adjust to the new routine. <laughs> it's not and we don't be. know. No, we don't know. Will we ever have will will we ever have physical conferences the way we used to have? Uh, I, will we, I think will we I think, will we have think, will we will we have debate in Goa next year? Yeah, we will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll never I'll never give up of meeting you <laughs> physically <laughs> and have a debate. It, yeah, that's one of the most. The meeting, the what, the thing, the most thing that I miss is uh, meeting friends and colleagues, you know, to chat and discuss and having a glass of wine together or yeah. a good debate <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the same. Yeah, I think we have two more minutes to start because we have given the time of 7 p.m. It's 1858 okay, sure. as per Indian time, so we have two minutes. So we are going to talk okay. on secondary prevention today for carotid intervention. No, no, first talk. No. Oh, sorry. Oh, but, this is not, yeah, this that's is what I'm the, seeing. The, I no, thought, I no, thought no, maybe this is not the one. Yeah, okay. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll change, I'll change it immediately. Okay, so good. It's good we met before. Yeah. <laughs> I was not, was I'm sorry, I didn't, I, was, I didn't realize the, the, the topic. I'm sorry. No, I was, that's okay. This is post post depression. That's the topic for today. But Nathan, if you yes. would have talked on if you would have talked on that, nobody would mind that. Also, all, all topics are good by you. <laughs> yeah, if, if you want, I can give. Uh, if you want me to come back on the next week, I'll, uh, no. What the what we are doing? Yeah, we, Nathan, we are now now that we know that this this thing is going to go for a long time. We are planning theme based stroke webinars. So in some themes, we'll discuss with you, and definitely you will be one of our honored speakers. It, they will be theme-based week after week. Uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. So and you can and you can and in fact you should also join them even if you are not a speaker in them for your comments with, and all. With, That'll be nice. with pleasure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If I get the if I get the invitation, I'll, I'll love to. Oh yes, you. oh yes. Perfect. So uh, I think we have Sudhir. Are you there? Debashish, Sudhir, any of our other friends? No, uh, sir, this is uh, Mansi here. Uh, Mansi. Hari is so, not here. So can I, can I start the proceedings? Yes, 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 yes. you can definitely so, start at 7. So, uh, so dear colleagues and friends, uh, I'm Subhash Kal from Hyderabad. I welcome you uh, to this uh, stroke webinar. And uh, this is actually in a series by Dr. Nathan Bonstein. Everybody knows Dr. Bonstein. He has been coming to India very regularly since past decade. He is director of the brain division in the Shari Zedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. He's chairman of the Israeli Stroke Society. And it would not be wrong to say that he's father of modern stroke care in Israel. He's also an eminent neurologist. He's one of the uh, very active members of the World Stroke Organization, has served, served as its vice president for many years. And uh, Today's topic is a very important topic. It's about post-stroke depression because uh, stroke management is not only acute stroke. Uh, after the few days of acute stroke, the patient is with us for the rest of his life. And the depression uh, plays a very important part in the patient's post-stroke symptoms, in his recovery. And in fact, there is a lot of data which says that uh, treatment of depression may help in stroke recovery, even the motor recovery. Now, a lot of papers are there, and Natan is the best person who will illuminate us on this subject. Please have your questions uh, and send your questions and answer. After the end of the talk, I will raise up your questions with Natan, and he'll be happy to answer your questions. Over to uh, Professor Natan Bonstein. Thank you very much, Yubash, and uh, thank you for again for having me to give this uh, lecture on post-stroke depression diagnosis and treatment. Before I start, I just want to dedicate this session to the late John Doris, who was my mentor in Toronto when I was there in the 
mid 80s and uh, he passed away just about a week ago for the COVID-19 in London, UK. So this lecture is dedicated to a great mentor and an amazing clinician and a wonderful person and uh, that I will miss and all the stroke community will miss. So this is for you, John. So what we have here, I think that most of us will deal on post-stroke physical disability and the emphasis is on post-stroke physical disability, rehabilitation, motor rehabilitation, but we should not forget that the consequence and the complication of stroke include also the cognitive, emotional, and behavioral disability. And uh, I think that up till now, the physical disability is just the tip of the iceberg. We should not forget the non-physical disability, personality changes, depression, emotionalism, memory loss, and other behavior. Uh, consequences of stroke and the depression is one of them and I'll concentrate now on the depression part and the DSM-5 defined depression as permanent or persistent mood disturbances characterized by depressive mood of course and lack of pleasure and inhonia causing distress or impairment in social occupation or other function. This is the current definition by the DSM-5 of depressive disorder due to stroke, what we call post-stroke depression. There are many scales that probably you're familiar with some of them to screen for depressive symptoms. The most kind of a commonly used is the Hamilton depression scale Hospital anxiety depression scale we use in our studies that I'll show you immediately is the geriatric depression scale. However, there, each one of them has some kind of limitation. Some of them are self-assessment, assessments. Some of them cannot because of the denial of the patient, they cannot assess it. A phasic patient cannot be assessed properly. So each one of them is, has its own limitations, but you can use whatever you want. So why is the depression or post-stroke depression so important? Why are we talking about it? The idea is that post-stroke depression is more prevalent than we think. If in many studies, uh, there is shown that about 20% to one third of patients uh, will have post-stroke depression. Depends if it's inpatient in the hospital or outpatient in the uh, outpatient clinics. But in that, in definitely many of them they have, they will have persistent depression, and about 55 of them will have major depression. So if we look at depression. Uh, in general, approximately one third of all our stroke patient survivors will suffer from post-stroke depression. And it's not just, it's very prevalent, but depression is strongly associated with further worsening of our physical, as well as cognitive recovery, and it's negative affected patient ability to engage in rehabilitation. If you're apathic, you don't have an energy, lack of energy, you don't want to participate, neither in rehabilitation, nor in integration back into the community. So depression is a major issue as after stroke, and we should not neglect it. So if you look, this is from Jose Ferro from Portugal, Lisbon. If you look at the items or the domains where the present disturbances are affecting outcome, 
First, it is associated with high mortality, more disability, high risk of stroke recovery, level of social functioning. Nowadays, we are talking about the loneliness effect. The depressive is actually patients are lonely, so uh, it affects your life and quality of life. And of course, family caregiver depression. Caregivers are also affected by the depressive symptoms of a post-stroke patient. So if you look, what are the risk factors? Why some people, if it's one third, means that two thirds of our patients will not develop depression. So what are the risk factors what, that are associated with post-stroke depression? So there's a list that you can see by yourself, female sex, past history of depression, of course, Psychiatric illness, functional limitation, I mean the more you dis the more disabled you are, the most likely that you will be depressed if you are before the stroke, you were fully function, functioning person, and cognitive impairment. So what are the predictor predictors of persistent depression after stroke? Is the lower level of pre-stroke social activity. If you were sort of uh, inactive before, you are more likely to develop persistent depression, greater severity of stroke, which is obvious, and lower level of function at baseline. I just would like to share with you a bit of our very spicy study called Tabasco in Tel Aviv. Tabasco stands for Tel Aviv Brain Acute Stroke Cohort Study. And uh, this is study is single center, uh, which uh, about 600 patients. We followed them for eight years. They all were first ever ischemic stroke, mostly mild to moderate because we like to have them for long term follow up. And there were over 50, and they were not depressed and not, not, did not have cognitive decline prior to the index stroke. And we, at baseline, we did a lot, a very extensive and intensive investigation, including MR, three Tesla MR, a lot of biological markers for inflammatory market, cytokines, cortisol, or stress, etc. We have questionnaire for depression, and of course, computerized cognitive assessment, and also MOCA, the, the computer the program, the software was called NeuroTrack. So uh, we did all this at baseline, and then we followed them for six in 12 months and then annually with all these parameters assessed every visit. So if you look at what we have found for the depression and stress, and this was published in Journal of Psychiatry in 2016, you can read it yourself. So we found that in general, Depressive, immediately after the event, about 15% have global depression score on the GDS. And six months later, about 20% will have a GDS geriatric depression scale above six, which is depressive symptom. But if we look in a multivariant analysis of those with GDS above six at admission and at six months post stroke or TIA, as I said, it was minor stroke or TIA. There was significant association between the GD, uh, GDS and cognitive impairment controlling for all the other variables. And this is just to share with Doug going into detail. If you look at all the domains, like integration, participation, and quality of life, those with GDS above six means that they were depressed at baseline at six months, did worse in all these domains, including cognitive decline. 
So this is another tip, another uh, piece of information to show that actually depression or depressive symptoms, not necessarily major depression, are associated with functional or worse functional outcome. What is the mechanism by which a single lacun, lacuna infarct or a small infarct somewhere in the brain will cause depression? So there are at least three possible explanations, as you can see. Either it's coincidental, because the patient was depressed before, and this was just a trigger, or it's a physical disability consequence, because all of a sudden you become disabled from a fully active life. You become disabled, that's, of course, will cause depressive symptoms. Or there are another potential uh, mechanism is the neurotransmitter imbalance. So this is the, so we actually divide the mechanism or potential mechanism between neuroanatomical theory and psychological theory. Neuroanatomical is assuming that the post depression is caused by a lesion that are actually involved the disruption of frontal or left frontal area and affect the neural circuit involved mood regulation. And it was proposed the disruption of this neuroaminergic pathway and the depletion of this cortical biogenic amines due to disruption of this frontal subcortical circuit. This was, this was actually proposed by Robinson that show that basically the right, uh, the left frontal lobe is most, uh, most as, mostly as visually the left frontal lobe is mostly associated with depressive symptoms. I, however, I think that uh, basically we can all assume that it's a multifactorial origin, either by vision location, psychological factor, because of your disabled. And you can say that lo lesion localization is in, involved in the early post stroke depression. However, the psychological factors may be associated and involved in the late post stroke depression. Having said all that, and uh, you, I think that you appreciate that it is a prevalent problem after stroke. This problem affects our patient's outcome, and it's involved many factors that, and risk factors that are uh, associated with post-stroke depression. The question is, what can we do? Having said all that, can we treat to prevent this effect on this subgroup of patients that are more likely or more prone to post stroke depression. So there were several cohort studies and I just show you some of the data of intervention of, for treating depression after stroke. This is from the Corcoran Library back in 2008 already 12 years ago, they included 16 trials with 17 different interventions, including 600, 600 patients, 1,600 patients. And you can see that there were four psychotherapy trials that couldn't show any evidence of benefit, and about 13 pharmacological therapy, mainly with SSRI versus placebo or tricyclic antidepressant versus placebo. And the conclusion of this review or meta-analysis by Hackett showed that antidepressant drug may, may produce recovery or improve depression symptom. However, they also found that this drugs may cause increase in adverse effect 
which might in sometimes offset the benefit of the SSRI. In 2012, about four years after that, there was another Cochrane meta-analysis of the only on SSRI as an intervention to prevent post-stroke depression. The objective was to, deter, to determine whether SSRI improved recovery after stroke and whether treatment with stroke is associated with adverse event. They included 56 completed trials. Most of them were small trials. 4,000 patients, more than 4,000 patients were included. And the conclusion was that SSRI appeared to improve dependence, disability, and neurological impairment, anxiety, as well as depression after stroke. But most of these were small trials, and there was heterogeneity between trials and methodological limitation in the subpopulation. So they conclude, as, as you know, the Cochrane is usually said, okay, there's some signal of efficacy now, large and well-designed trials are needed to better, uh, to better see whether SSRI should be given routinely to patients with stroke, routinely. So in 2017, there was another meta-analysis done by the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, scientific statement, and they include eight trials of pharmacotherapy trials. The conclusion was may be effective. Psychological intervention, five trials may prevent, it's all may, and psychological and uh, information provision, many small trials, but none of them was actually with firm conclusion to say that uh, we should uh, treat our patient, all of our post-stroke patients with antidepressants. The first well done, small trial in France, tested actually whether fluoxetine will affect, will be beneficial for motor recovery after the skin stroke, not just the depression, the motor recovery, assuming that if you will be better in the physical activity or the physical recovery, this will also affect also the mood and other non-physical component of the consequence of the stroke. So they will be giving 20 milligrams of fluoxetine over 90 days against, against placebo, and all, all the patients receive standard care in organizing in-stroke team care. And the outcome measure was Fugelmeier motor scale on the upper limb and the lower limbs in the affected side. And this was assessed in 30, 90 days. If you look, it was a very positive trial. Everybody was very excited. 2011 was published uh, in Lancet Neurology. And you can see that in nine, at 90 days, the difference between the progression between nine, a baseline and 90 days, Fugelmeier improved uh, against placebo in the upper limb and the lower limb and was statistically significant. But look at the number, 56 patients in one arm and 57 in the other arm. Small study, but positive. Everybody was excited. And this is just the, the bar, what we call the grotto bar, showing that basically fluoxetine, the one to zero MRS, the modified Rutgen scale was much better than the, in the placebo group. There was no difference in mortality. And so therefore this 
uh, trial was actually the basis for a huge trials that this was the three big trials, focus, affinity, and effect, effects that were supposed to include altogether 6,000 patients. Administration uh, trying to see whether administration of fluoxid 20 milligram daily for three months after stroke will improve patient functional outcome at six months and the first results were published in the Lancet 2019. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the FOCUS trial. The FOCUS trial was again, randomized control study. More than 3000 patients were recruited. Half of them were given fluoxetine, 20 milligrams, and half of them were given placebo. And the data at six months were available for about 100 patients in each group, or 100% in each group. And as you can see here, without going into detail, unfortunately, this trial locks it into 20 milligrams given daily for six months after stroke does not seem to improve functional outcome. However, the, the, the study showed that the Fluoxetine treatment reduced the occurrence of depression. However, increased frequency of bone fractures, especially hip fracture. So the adverse effect was actually offset uh, the, by the beneficial effect of depression was offset by the adverse event of bone fracture. And these are the, again, just the data to show that with all these, if you look at the MRS zero to six, there was no difference between placebo group and the fluoxetine group. There was another study, the TALOS study. And the TALOS study uh, this time examined the efficacy of citalopram, Cipralex, in acute stroke. This was the Danish trial. And they, the, cip, the citalopram was given within seven days after symptoms in non-depressed first ever ischemic stroke. And the follow-up was for six months. Small, again, 642 patients were included, randomized into either placebo or citalopram. And if you look at the results, early citalopram treatment did not improve functional recovery. So again, SSRI so far could not show any beneficial effect on functional outcome after stroke. And this is the conclusion of the, as you can see, the from the Lancet says, fluoxetine 20 milligram are uh, actually in acute for not improved functional outcome, although some, there's some beneficial effect on depression, number needed to treat to N27. However, there's a potential increase in bone fracture in one treated group. There is another meta-analysis just showing the same 13 trials, 4,000 patients. Again, this is a class one evidence demonstrate that fluoxetine does not reduce disability and dependency of the stroke. Very disappointing after the flame study that I've shown you the French one that showed such a beneficial, significant beneficial effect. So if you look at the post-stroke use of selective serotonin uptake inhibitor, the nationwide prospective study, that's again, uh, if you look just to show you show some data, whenever you use the SSRIs, if you want to use the SSRIs in your patient, you have to look at the, and this is a have effect. This SSRI has effect not just of the stroke, but if you look at stroke, myocardial infarction and recurrent stroke, it was beneficial effect. However, this is a thing that you all have to know and we have to know. There is an ev there is some evidence to show 
is basically the high risk of major bleeding with administration of SSRI. So if, you're patient, if you have a patient with high risk of bleeding, of previous bleeding, and I'm talking about major bleeding, you have to be careful when you administer SSRI. So SSRI use after it can stroke was associated with lower risk of cardiovascular event. However, is it has increased bleeding risk. We have all to be aware of it. And another point that I would like to stress is the interaction with fluoxetine and voxamine, all the SSRI, the chip 2C19 inhibitors with Plavix, with clopidogrel. And as you can see here, patients on Plavix or this chip 2C19 inhibitors and SSRI then increase risk of ischemic stroke because the SSRI will decrease the anti-aggregant effect of clopidogrel. So being treated with clopidogrel, SSRI when initiating clopidogrel may decrease the effect of clopidogrel. So patients on SSRI that come to stroke and you put them on clopidogrel, be aware that SSRI will affect the, uh, will reduce the effect of clopidogrel on one end. And if you start SSRIs after stroke on patients on clopidogrel, you have to know that there is an instant action just for your knowledge. So the American guidelines, American Heart Association guidelines said the effectiveness of fluoxetine or other SSRI to enhance motor recovery is not well established. Levodopa and others are not very well established. I just want to mention there is a, a, some other potential drugs in the horizon, and this is the cerebralizing. You are familiar with cerebralizing, and uh, it is, has a neuroprotection and neurorecovery effect. And cerebralizing demonstrated to facilitate, facilitate brain toxicity, plasticity, and neurogenesis. There are a lot of evidence from animal models as well as in human showing the effect of cerebralizing as the trophic like factor and increase all these good growth factors. And by that, increase the recovery of the brain after lesions, either stroke or traumatic brain injury. So if you look at the data, and this is one of the large studies that were conducted with cerebralizing and recovery after stroke, it's called the CAR study, it was a randomized, double-blind control study, it was a multi-center study, and if without going into detail, because you can read it. It was published in Stroke 2015. And we look at all the recovery items. All the estimate points fall in favor of cerebralizing. But if these are the NHSAs, Bartel and MRA, they are all significant in favor of cerebralizing. But if you look at the depression, which was part of the pre-specified secondary outcome, or secondary endpoint, see a very significant effect with a very large size, effect size of cerebralizing on depression. And if you look, just this is the data, if you look at cerebralizing in 100 patients compared to control, there was a 72% improve in cerebralizing depression improve compared to only 42, 43%, 44% in this control group. And if you look at those that went from shift from severe depression to mild depression, this was 2% versus zero 
in the placebo group. So definitely the depression, post-stroke depression was improved and serverized and had a beneficial effect against control. This was a stroke. The same, was, this is not published yet, but it was presented. The efficacy and safety of serverizing in uh, TBI patients. And again, this was a, in moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, very sophisticated way to analyze the beneficial effect in TBI is not easy, but this was a very, they established a very interesting way to establish a global effect on many domains in post TBI outcome. And as you can see here, without going into details, all these again, this is a multivariate outcome in 90 days, early recovery phase, and uh, this is per protocol. And you can see again, all, if you look all the domain together, there is a beneficial effect. If you look at depression, and this is the Hamilton depression scale, this is the Hamilton anxiety scale, definitely again, like in after stroke, you see again the beneficial effect of this the cerebralizing against placebo. So this is the, if you look at the scientific detail, and this is the, just a zoom into the depression part, cerebralizing measured by Hamilton depression scale has beneficial effect in 90 days after stroke and after TBI, and it's standalone a significant also on day 30. And this is uh, just to show that basically Austria and we, we have rehabilitation guidance include cerebralizing as the first evidence based rehabilitation. Uh, and the cerebralizing is the best assessed compound evaluated with class two level B evidence of beneficial effect. And this is the only efficacy and main drug in the rehabilitation guide. Another potential treatment is, of course, the TMS, and there is a or in post a stroke depression, only small, the magnetic uh, stimulation, transmagnetic stimulation, and small studies. And it was shown that they safe to do it. However, the study was too small to show a fair and significant beneficial effect, but I think that the most studies are currently conducted without TMS in post from depression. So if you look at the global picture of post from depression, as I told you, there are some predictors, patients with small vessel disease, especially that were with severe stroke, with social isolation, and poor coping skills will probably more likely to develop and female and uh, more likely to develop post-stroke depression. However, in the treatment management up to now, uh, we have not found uh, the drug or any intervention, uh, psych psychiatry intervention, psych psych psychotherapy, etc., is effective as I showed you they are, uh, the SSRIs were not found to be very, very significant beneficial effect, especially on the global functional outcome of the patient with adverse events. So we have to be aware the cerebralizing that is emerging as a potential drug. There are currently ongoing study on cerebralizing and post-stroke depression. And I think that's what I would like, wanted to show you that you should raise the awareness of post-stroke depression. The awareness is too low. We don't assess normally and routinely our patient in our outpatient clinic post-stroke for depression. We should. We should routinely screen for it because if we intervene with every intervention, together with the family, together with the caregiver, together with uh, maybe drugs, I think that we sh 
can help our patients and we know more about it uh, in the future. So be well and try to get the patients assessed for post-COVID depression. And I thank you very, very much. Thank you, uh, Nathan for that very comprehensive review of literature. I mean, I, I have always noticed that whenever you give talks, you comprehensively review the entire literature and you are a very realistically optimistic neurologist. You are optimistic, but you are realistically oh. optimistic. So while you will yeah. tell us about the advantages, you will also tell us about the side effects, but at the same time, you are optimistic. So thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, now uh, uh, start the question and answer session we have. Many questions, and I think uh, you can, because some people have joined late, many of these questions you have already addressed in your talk, but some people joined late, so it will be a revision for us, so you can quickly answer. So the first question is, uh, uh, the, all, all questions are about today's talk of depression and stroke. So the first question is, what is your take on fluoxetine in motor recovery in flame? You already said it, but you can maybe say it again. Motor recovery in flame. Yeah, Tim. The motor recovery flame was uh, positive. It was a small study and uh, with a very positive effect on motor and limb function. Motor or limb function, that is not talking about depression, but the functional outcome in MRS was positive. However, unfortunately, in a large scale trial, this fluoxetine was not showing any beneficial effect. You know, I'm talking about more than 3,000 patients, right? And there, there's another one, the affinity will be published soon. And I, I still don't know the result, but then they will combine this affinity and focus together. There will be many patients in the, in the pooled analysis and we'll see. But so far, there is no recommendation to treat all patients. Of course, individual patients, if you see the patient is depressed and uh, there is no uh, kind of, he's not on clopidogrel, be aware, and there is no risk of bone fracture or falling and breaking the hip, then I, I usually put patients on fluoxetine or citalopram if I actually assess and find depressive symptoms, or oh, the caregiver usually complain of lack of energy, apathy, anhedonia, etc., and fatigue. Fatigue is one of the things that actually, for me, is a sine equinon to depression. And uh, we have to be always aware that if patients complain of tiredness, the bed is kind of a uh, very good place for me. Be aware, this is depressive. Is the, one of the major depressive and the first depressive symptom that uh, increase my awareness, and then I treat the patient. Hello. Cool. Hello. <clears throat> There's some disturbances. Hello. Yes, hello. I'm here. Hello. 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 I'm here. Hello. Hello, Nathan, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you very well. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes. Now the other question is that what is your what is your choice of uh, deciding about the antidepressants? Uh, yeah, my, I, I do use either SSRI or SNRIs. Uh, the name of the drug is not important. If it's fluoxetine or citalopram. No, you the, the one minute, Nathan. The, the specific question is that do you decide the uh, drug based on the age, gender, associated comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, ischemic heart disease, are there, do, do these factors determine that which antidepressant you choose since you have got so many of them now? So, so please. Yeah, I, I usually in the elderly, I don't use 
tricyclic antidepressants. They may cause confusion because of the anticholinergic effect, and spe specifically if the patient has prostate problems or any heart problem, like uh, arrhythmias. So CTA, the, the, the cyclic, the tricyclic TCA, uh, I'm not, usually I don't use it in the LSD, and uh, I, in the last decade or so, I use mostly the SSRIs. Now, the, again, as I mentioned, the SSRI may cause major bleeding, not very significant, but um, in a small proportion. So patient with comorbidities like GI bleed in the past, or definitely with intracerebral hemorrhage, I try not to use the SSRIs. Uh, I found the, the SNRIs, the serotonin and noradrenergic inhibitors as a very uh, powerful uh, drug. If, for instance, the patient suffers from, on one hand, uh, depression and also from pain, post-stroke pain, then I usually, I can use either regabalin or the Cymbalta. I'm sure that you have the symbol in, 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 in there as well. So duloxetine. So in this case, it depends. This might be then you take two birds in one in one pit, I would say. Yeah. So that's a, usually what they do. Does it also depend on if patient has insomnia? Are there any antidepressants which can promote sleep and other antidepressants yes. which can promote wakefulness? Yes. The the mirror. The Miro, for instance, the uh, lazapine, I, it's more, much better for sleep disorders. This is good for if the patient has sleep or insomnia or sleep disturbances, then I give them a Miro, it's 15 or 30 milligrams uh, just before going to bed. And uh, this is my policy for this patient with insomnia. So the other question is, how long do you continue antidepressants? How long, how many months do you give them? I think usually, usually it, takes, it takes about six months at least, between three to six months to reassess the patient to see. If the patient is back to normal and he is very happy, then I stop. Some, there is some people that said, okay, there is no kind of addiction to SSRI. But the other, there's some evidence that there is addiction. And so I try not to use it for long, too long time. Okay. But I think okay. that always, again, I want to say that the drug itself is not a stand-alone intervention. The rehabilitation, exercise, integration in the community, and back to social activities, and physical activity is part of the package. The drug, this SSRI, SNRI, whatever, is just a part of the whole package to get the patient back to his kind of cognitive and mood and behavioral activities. Okay. Nathan, there's one question from my side. Uh, uh, you know, some of these stroke patients actually uh, may have apathy, particularly the frontal lobe or caudate uh, lesions, uh, which is different from depression. And many of these apathy patients may not respond that good to uh, antidepressants. And some people have suggested that um, this dopa, dopa may help there. Now, we don't know about all this. Do you have any thoughts on this apathy versus depression and their treatment? I think it's, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's, a bit, we should this differentiate between apathy and depression. They are not the same. And uh, I think that's uh, because if you treat apathy with antidepressant drug, nothing is there. So in some instances, if you have also a little bit of cognitive decline with the apathy, I find that, uh, I find that the uh, excellent 
might be a good solution because the exelon also increase the vividity of the patient and the activity of the patient. So in this case, sometimes okay. I use excellent patch or okay. excellent drug for treating apathy. Although okay. and the dopamine, dopamine was not proven to be effective okay. In, uh, okay. in these patients. Yeah, that is good. Uh, uh, excellent, you mean rivastigmine? Yeah. Rivastigmine, yes. Uh, so, yeah. Nathan, uh, there are a lot of questions on cerebrolysin because you have really uh, shown some studies in favor of cerebrolysin. So first question to you is, do you yourself use cerebrolysin after acute stroke? I use it, Chuck, as a compassionate, uh, hello. because we, it's not, hello? Hello. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Do you, do you use, do you, do you yourself use cerebrolysin after acute stroke? It's in your cerebrolysin is, it, it's not registered in Israel, so I can use it only like uh, an off, la off label. I mean, I have to get a special permission to use okay. it. Okay. And we start, we start to use it now, and uh, okay. in, and as a study on post-stroke yes. depression okay. in patients with recanalization and from back to. Okay. Somebody has We're asked. Just starting. Uh, yeah. Somebody has asked dose of cerebrolysin in acute stroke. Uh, obviously, then you may not be answering this question, but I can answer that. That we I use can. cerebrolysin. Uh, yeah, you can answer. Please go ahead. No, no, no. It, uh, you, uh, I think that the study is between thirty to fifty milligrams milliliter per uh, per day. This is the per trip. This okay. is the this is the currently the end. Also, we've learned from the, the recent study that I've presented that in this patient, you can give it for 10 days or 21 days, and then you have to give boosters yes. along, along the day. No, it's not just one, let's say, seven days or 10 days shot, and yeah. that's it. You yeah. have to give booster after that. I don't know what is your experience in, in India. No, you see, in India, now they have come out with cerebrolysin tablets. I don't know whether there are any yeah, studies yeah. or that or not. Studies were, main studies were intravenous studies where they have to be given for two to three weeks. But now tablets have been marketed in India, and many of us give these tablets, uh, 90 milligram tablet for three months. Uh, uh, but that is just, uh, I'm, not uh, you sure, know. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that there is, this is evidence-based. Yeah. Evidence-based yeah, is that's on correct. IV. That's correct. On that's IV. Correct. So... That's correct. You can do whatever so the, you want, but yeah. if you look so the, for evidence-based medicine, it's correct. IV. Correct. I agree. The ev evidence is for IV. And uh, I think next yeah. question you already answered is how long this IV cerebrolysin to be given after acute stroke, which you already I just, answered. I just, I just said, it. Uh, the, if you look at the, at the, at the studies, that between 10 and 21 days. Yeah. Do you and uh, next question is: Does cerebr does cerebrolysin improve depression? You have already answered that it does. Uh, Nathan, uh, do you keep the patient indoor uh, for hello? To give? The, the, this is one of the problems that uh, to give to leave to give to leave the patient in the hospital for a long time, like uh, more than ten days. In many cases, in many instances, it's impossible. So you have to find this, uh, the way how to bring the patient as an outpatient, as an outpatient, the outpatient clinic, we, uh, in order to, there's a day hospitalization in Israel, there is a, such a thing that you can bring the patient for day hospitalization, give the IV any treatment, and then the patient go back home to uh, not, not uh, staying in the hospital. That's the only solution. Okay, I think Subhash has got blocked. What has happened to Subhash? Uh, uh, somebody's asked. Yeah, yeah, hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yes. Yeah, Nathan, uh, the other question is what do you uh, have? You, is there any data on the allergic reactions of allergic reactions with cerebrolysin? Because many people have experienced allergic reactions uh, I, with cerebrolysin. I, I, I not. I'm not sure whether it's a allergic reaction or some kind of. Uh, it's what what I know about is that if the drug is not kept in a proper way, this may cause sort of uh, 
allergic reaction or some fever, but usually, and I've been involved in the several studies of serbolizing and the main one was the Castor one with more than 1,000 patients. There is no any concern about adverse event or safety of serbolizing. Every drug can have some kind of uh, allergic reaction and things like that, like any, any drug. But so, there is no there is no difference between in all the studies. In all the studies. No, there's no, no differences between serbolizing and placebo in terms of side effects. So, so one question is that should we use cerebrolysin in all stroke patients, irrespective of their type, whether they are hemorrhagic or ischemia, and irrespective of their severity, whether they are lacunar or large artery? Can we use it as a, uh, you know, one for all, all kinds of stroke? This, what, this is, is an excellent Hemorrhage, question. ischemia, lacunar, non-lacunar, cardioembolic, should it be used all across the board? We know the, as data, the, the, data, yeah, the data that are available is on ischemic stroke. First, there's anecdotal cases also on hemorrhagic stroke, but the data is on ischemic stroke, one. Two, the, if you look at the all patient, I can tell you for the sub-analysis of the serbolizing data, it seems that the best, if you have a, a mild stroke, there's a ceiling effect in the, in the randomized control study it couldn't show that serbolizing is better than the placebo. However, if you look at the moderate to severe stroke, 10 NHSS, 12 NHSS, above nine, let's say, this has shown a significant effect, not just on the depression, but also on the functional outcome by the MRS and, and by tel scale and NHSS. So, I've published a meta-analysis on, on all the studies, the very thorough meta-analysis that actually show the definite efficacy of cerebralizing on functional outcome, MRS, NHSS at 30 days and 90 days, and also on cognitive. I'm not showing the cognitive. You ask me to give a talk on cognitive, I can show you also this, but on cognitive, and as I shown you, this was a secondary endpoints on depression. So definitely, uh, if you look at the ischemic stroke, moderate to severe group, this is the group that should be treated because if it's small, if you have an NHSS a small, uh, we don't know about long-term result, if you look in depression itself, we have shown that depression is not necessarily in severe strokes or moderate strokes. They may occur also in, in mild strokes. So maybe serbolizing is good. If you look at depression itself, maybe serbolizing is good also for mild, moderate, moderate stroke to severe strokes. Okay, now the other question is that because cerebrolysin has been promoted as a neuroprotective agent. Mm -hmm. Now in India, there are other neuroprotective agents which, are, which have been marketed since many years. One of the most uh, prevalent is uh, uh, citicoline, citicoline and piracetam. So is there any mm -hmm. data about citicoline and piracetam in post-stroke depression or recovery, according to you? Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I know piracetam, it uh, there is no data to show that piracetam is actually effective as a neuroprotective. Citicoline was tested in a huge study in, in Spain and the, the Ibero uh, Spanish uh, group, and it was negative in terms of functional outcome. And uh, in terms of as I said, for cognitive, I don't know about depression, but if you're talking about neuroprotection and neuro recovery, there is no evidence that CD calling in the literature in meta-analysis. There's again, it's there is a lot of problem with problem. the meta-analysis because the meta-analysis studies were, were small, 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 
and uh, also and, uh, the heterogeneity uh, between the study. Between but in 2015, there was a Sabina study that have shown that there's no actually effect. Yeah. So there's also a question about the role of Adderavon. It's a Japanese drug which some of FDA approved. I, I, I've not, I'm sorry, but uh, I cannot tell you because I know, I know the drug, but I know, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the drug and I'm not actually very acquainted with it. So I cannot, I cannot say anything about the Japanese. But if you look, I think that the difference between, you're talking about, about neuroprotection and neurorecovery, there are two different things. Neuroprotection is in the acute phase. What I what I've shown in, in with cerebral life that is the, actually the claim is that it's a neuroprotective drug, a neuro recovery drug, not in the acute phase, which is neuroprotection. You have to you have to give a long term and look at the neuro recovery. That's what we've seen with cerebral life in, that the long-term recovery is better with thermalizing against placebo and not necessarily the neuroprotective effect of it, but no recovery. Like okay. being, a, being a biological uh, trophic-like medication, that's, and there's a lot of data to show with Michael Chop from Detroit and shown a lot of data how this that actually works. Nathan, there is a there's a very interesting question on the role of CNS stimulants in post-stroke depression. Now, if you remember, there have been studies on amphetamine and methylphenidate earlier on. So, is there any? Uh, do you have any thoughts on yeah, all, CNS all, stimulant? In all this data on this stimulant, so enhancer, what we call the brain uh, function enhancers, uh, were not. It was done. First of all, it was done many years ago. And uh, there was only small studies with actually no beneficial effect shown significant the beneficial effect in the randomized control study. But there were very small studies on this. So the, in the recent years, I've not heard of any large study that was conducted on yes. these enhancers. There's one, there's one question on neurotracks. I don't know what is neurotrax. Neurotrax can be accessed in India and how much does it cost per year? You you understand this question? Neurotrax neuro can be accessed in yeah. Ne neurotrax is the tool. Okay. If I if I understand that's what we use. Neurotrax is and how much how much does it cost right? per year? Uh, cost. I, I don't know, but uh, okay. I, know, I, I don't know. But this is the tool this was tested. This is a computerized cognitive assessment tool, computerized, and uh, I, the, the, I don't know about the price. We are using it because it was a stuff, it was a, actually introduced in Israel, and uh, we've, we've done our studies with narrow trucks. It's been validated in large uh, populations in different parts of the world, so it's a, and you have normals for different ages in the population. So. Uh, I think uh, this uh, the Oxford group is doing another uh, the, uh, this uh, sort of cognitive testing. Which, uh, so many, uh, so many of them. Uh, Eris was uh, doing it. Cambridge, yeah. they did it for Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge, so Cambridge. That test, Cambridge. The Cambridge, oh, sorry, yeah. The, the Cambridge, Cambridge has a, a different a different assessment and. Uh, and there's the can club. There's many, many ways. Can tab. It's called can tab. Can -tab. Can -tab. Exactly. The can tab. And this is the this is the, the Cambridge group. And many people use it, especially in Europe. Uh, the can tab. So is a neurotrack something like can tab? No, it's different. It's on different domains and a different way of conducting. Okay. okay. No, Eris has already completed one on the general population to find the, uh, uh, you know, the normative data. They have finished that part and now they will go to the next stage. So, yeah. uh, Nathan, can you, can you hear me, Nathan? Yes, yes. Nathan, can you hear? Yeah. So, yeah, with yeah, that, yeah. we come to the end. 
with that with that we come to the end of the question answer session i must say that was a very informative session and i am sure all of us are going to use cerebral lysin much more than what we were doing before because stroke is such a desperate situation we want to do anything uh, whatever help to the patient I and that and i will also ask sudeep yeah uh, it's uh, a good fact go and i have to say that i don't have any shares in the company so don't no. <laughs> <laughs> So, so they, I'm not so promoting they, yeah, the same but, but it's yeah. an excellent it's an excellent yeah. idea to use it. This yeah. is about intravenous cerebral lysine. Uh, we yeah. cannot do oral tablets on the basis of the intravenous. So no, I think I think I think uh, I think uh, Sudhir just now, Doctor Butch, my friend from Baroda, neurologist there, he for. He has sent me a message that it is not same. It is cerebral protein, and this is cerebral lysine. I think Absolutely. we have to go over and study. They are it's, different. It's not the yeah. same. Thank you, Doctor Butch. So they are, yeah. They are similar, yeah. biological similar drug, but it's not the same. If you, do, you if you want to use it, evidence-based medicine in only the original drug that is tested, been uh, uh, published, and you can look at the publication. This is the only way to go. So, uh, so, 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 Nathan, uh, before I I hand over to Dr. Sudhir because I would want Dr. Sudhir to give final comments. I would just want to tell you. I would just want to tell you. that you have been you are a real friend because the first webinar first stroke webinar was given by you and the definition of a friend is who is there you with you in the beginning and who is with you till the end so what we are going to do now you you have been with us since last more than a month now we are going to have a series of stroke webinars in which they will be team based webinars each team will be for about a month these will be weekly morning stroke sessions or other subjects and in strokes we would always want you to have as one of the speakers you can uh, join other stroke seminars also because your uh, review of the literature is uh, as i would again summarize optimistically realistic so uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you nat and sudhir sudhir would thank you, you please give a final comment it's a pleasure and honor to be with you and uh, whenever thank you need me i'm here yes and sudhir can you give the final comments i just had the same thing to say to you that you've been there you were willing to adjust the dates and you were just uh, very friendly and thank you nathan you're very very welcome thank you bye bye thank you